Are you a businesswoman who is finding it challenging to get your ideas across and make a point? Welcome to Speakers Who Get Results with Elizabeth Bachman, a podcast dedicated to helping women get the visibility they want, whether making a speech or talking in a meeting. Every week, get valuable lessons from Elizabeth or learn from her roundtable conversations with experts and speakers on how to make a difference, not just a point. On to the show with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. Hello and welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. I'm Elizabeth Bachman, your host, and this is the podcast where we interview experts from around the world on how to get your listeners to do what you want them to do when you make a presentation. This also has to do with leadership and visibility that is behind what makes you stand up and do a presentation. And it also has to do with the challenges of communication. So I'm very excited to be talking to Gina Graham today, who is a fellow presentation skills trainer. Before we get into Gina's information, though, I want to invite you to go to our three, four minute assessment, our free quiz at speakforresultsquiz.com. That's speakforresultsquiz.com. And that's where you can take four minutes to see where you are rocking your presentation skills and where you might need a little bit of support. So Gina Graham, welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. Good morning, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Happy to Um, be here. Well, I'm just gonna read your bio, but I wanna make sure that I can ask you a couple of questions about this. So uh, the official bio is Gina Graham maintains a lifelong fascination with interpersonal communication, specifically the role that gender plays in one's assumptions, biases, and reactions. And Gina, I'm so excited to have you on here because this is a huge topic and the sorts of things that I talk about when I work with my clients, and I know you do too. You and I have sat in the corner in the bar and traded stories (laughs) many a time. Uh, And and so Gina, in the first 10 years of her career, her observations helped her navigate the business world while male. And in the 25 years since her gender transition as a female, These experiences provide her with unique insight and credibility to connect with audiences. Gina's worked in sales across a variety of tech verticals, pitched and secured VC funding as an entrepreneur, won national and international awards in public and persuasive speaking. She is a lecturer in strategic communication and a communication coach at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Also, Gina's building executive presence programs at Google are wildly popular, with some having a three-month waiting list. I can totally believe that. She's also president of the Golden Gate Business Association, which is the LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce in San Francisco. And that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer Chamber of Commerce, for those of you who aren't familiar with the acronym. So, Gina, welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. Thank you, thank you. And let me ask you, the first, the question I always ask my, I ask my guests is, if you could have an interview with somebody from history, someone who's not around at the moment to talk to, who would it be, what would you ask them, and who ought to be in the audience to listen? Oh my gosh, that's, that is a great question. There are so many people from history that I would love the opportunity to just sit back and listen to. So um, I would default to the one that I constantly go to is my, the primary heroine of my life, and that would be uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. And uh-huh. why it would be her? Because I find her personal story incredibly fascinating, overcoming, even though she was somewhat born into wealth, a little bit of wealth, not as much as people think. She had tremendous hardship growing up as a child, uh, and she managed to overcome that, and she became first lady of the world, not just first lady of the United States. She chartered the the uh, the rights of that wrote the, the bill for the United Nations. 
Uh, she wrote so many books, thousands of columns. She actually out earned her husband, Franklin, who when, when he was president, she was doing two or three presentations a day. She was incredibly prolific. Uh, so there's so many questions I would love to ask her. Primarily, how did you manage to do all of this? As far as I know, she only had the same 24 hours in a day as we do, but the output of what she did was amazing. Yes, it's a, you know, I, I recently watched the documentary of Michelle Obama's book tour for her book, Becoming. And she was yes. talking about the strains of being first lady and being, uh, which is even more so now that everybody in the world is watching you but um, also dealing with a husband who was half paralyzed. So, uh, so it not only, you know, you only saw carefully selected pictures of him and her, but that must have been quite a strain in life. And yet they did so much. They did. And from most accounts, while Franklin certainly was progressive, there's no question about that. Um, it could be argued that his progressive views came from her. She pushed him toward equal rights. She pushed him to uh, creating uh, programs that would help the poor and downtrodden, not just white people that were poor, but black people that were poor. Uh, she was a huge advocate for civil rights in the 1940s. So mm -hmm. uh, I, she, she is sometimes a little unsung for that. And one of the most amazing things I found about her, facts about her, when when she learned that women were not allowed in the press briefings with the President Roosevelt, she created her own. She started doing press briefings mm -hmm. as the First Lady, and only female reporters were allowed in the room. So she held press briefings for just women reporters, it, and she just that staunch advocate for women's rights. That's, a, that's actually a very interesting way to, to put it. Uh, I remember having many conversations with people about women's rights and diversity, even now, you know, here we are in 20, we're two decades into the, the 21st century, and we're still talking about women's rights. The definition has, ex has changed a little bit, I think, or expanded, but we're still talking about how to be heard and very aware that getting, say, women on boards is just the beginning. It means diversity for all people. It div racial diversity helps companies and gender diversity and all sorts of age diversity helps companies. I mean, there are statistics that say companies with diverse, corporations with diverse boards do, I think it was 19% better, get 19% more mm -hmm. profit than the ones that are all one or all the other. So if you think about Eleanor Roosevelt starting that way, I'm curious, you're a lecturer at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. When you do, when you talk about building executive presence and strategic communications there, where do you start? I'm assuming that your classes are, are um, mixed male, female, right? Yes, and the, uh, they, they run the spectrum on gender as, uh, as well as nationality. All of that is there. Uh, I'm very fortunate that the, the primary program at the GSB is, is been written uh, by the current professor who, who leads it, uh, uh, Bert. He's an amazing teacher, an amazing coach, and, and J.D. Schramm, who created this program many years ago. So I add from... From my side, I'm happy to add my experiences and a little bit of how what I teach and what I've experienced uh, to aid in that. But it is it's a program that, that Bert Alder has created that is is just incredible. Uh, so where do I start with executive presence in in my training or in the the one on one coaching with people? Well, the first question I always ask is, what does executive presence mean to you? Mm -hmm. You know, and everyone tends to have a different definition about that. It can be uh, body language, mannerism, being calm, able to effectively communicate their message to different audiences. As many people as you ask is pretty much as the number of definitions you're going to get for what executive presence is. So I tend to default to uh, 
uh, the definition with a bit of an homage to Supreme Court Justice Potter when he was describing obscenity in the Supreme Court. He said, I know it when I see it. And I think that executive presence is the same way. It might be hard to quantify and, and specifically put down in words, but you know it when you see it. Okay, I'm going to have to ask, I'm going to add you a different side of this is one of the things that I have heard and seen is that oh, he just doesn't have executive presence, or she just doesn't have executive presence, can often be a code for, we really don't want to hire that person because they're different, different skin color, different gender, they're different from us, if you will, but we don't have a good reason for it, so um, I don't know, just something just doesn't feel right, so it must be lack of executive presence. How do you answer that? I, my first reaction would be that's, that's a, uh, it's a bit of a catch-all statement mm -hmm. and it requires uh, follow-up questions because it's, it's, an, it's a very large bucket to put a, a, a uh, cast a dispersion into or an opinion, but you would need to drill down to what does that mean? You know, mm -hmm. often it, I've, people say, well, you know, she doesn't have executive presence how you know what exact give me an example of where you notice this or you notice a lack of this and mm -hmm. often it might come down to well i feel that she's young well i feel that she sounds young or presents young or i feel that uh he's just not confident he doesn't have any gravitas or he's not able to persuade anyone you've got to drill down and getting a specific example of what exactly, how are they defining executive presence to say someone else doesn't have it? How do you find out? How do you hear that? If they, if they say, well, you know, lack of executive presence, do you ever get to uh, talk to the, within a company? Do you get to actually talk to the people who said that? Uh, quite often. And mm -hmm. it, it, it gets both sides. Uh, often I'll talk to the person who has been told that a, uh, a heightened executive presence is what's needed to advance their career. So they're coming in with the feedback they've been given. Um, other times I do have the ability to talk to the supervisor because they're the one making the decision. So my idea of executive presence, the person who has received the, the feedback, their idea of executive presence can both be very different from the person who gave that opinion. So I need to get from the horse's mouth, so to speak. I need to find out exactly what it is that they're noticing or not noticing. Um, that can be a little tricky at times. Uh, it definitely has to be a conversation that is a bit, depending on who you're talking to, a bit off the record, because sometimes people will say something there that they are afraid might come back and sound sexist or might sound racist or it might sound ageist. So they're afraid to actually tell you what they're really feeling. So you have to create a safe space for them to do that because I can't solve a problem if I don't know what the problem is. So Gina, how do you, how can you show executive presence? How do you help people? What, what tips can our listeners get from you? Well, <clears throat> executive presence, if you want to distill it down to its most fundamental components, executive presence is really three attributes, three things. It is intentful eye contact, intentional eye contact. It is stillness, moving with only with purpose. And it is the pauses between what you say. So once again, the three, three components of executive presence, intentional eye contact, the pauses between what you say, and stillness. If you can master those three, you can master executive presence. It means you can communicate your message effectively to anyone, regardless of age, gender, title, stature, nationality, doesn't matter. Those three components and the, how you blend them depends on who you're talking to. Now you've said something about gravitas, which is a wonderful Latin word. Can you talk about how you define gravitas? How do I define gravitas? I yeah, we, we've, I got an, it, we've got an international audience here, so, not every, so a lot of people are listening in English, but it is their second or third language, so... Um, people might not know the word. Well, I mean, there's a, there's a certain weight to what you say. There's a certain ability to hold your space. And that comes back to 
the three components again, being able to look someone in the eye. And again, there's a lot of cultural issues at this one. So I, I work with a number of people, a great number of people who come from outside of the US wanting to work within the US. So mm -hmm. I have not worked in the opposite direction. I haven't worked in other cultures, only with people from other cultures. Mm -hmm. So yeah. understanding they're, they're, that it, that can play into it. Uh, but here, eye contact is crucial. You know, there's a certain semblance that if, in, in Western culture, if someone won't look you in the eye, you won't believe them. So, yes. you know, Elizabeth, if you ask me, so Gina, is this project going to be done this Friday? And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, we're working on this one, going to have this one. I've got everybody pulling it. If I'm not looking at you, you're not going to believe it. So mm -hmm. there's a, those, those three components again, the eye contact, the stillness, and the pauses between what you say, used effectively creates a gravitas. So tell me more about the pauses. What do you mean by the pauses between what you say? The pauses are incredibly important. And it goes back to the, the idea that short sentences are better than long. That when yes. you, what tends to happen is people tend to string two or three ideas into a single sentence when they really should be single ideas per sentence than having a break. It's in that slight break, those two or three moments of pause that allow people to take what you've said and digest it. It's just like that. It doesn't take long. It's just moments of pause because it's in those moments that you let us know something as a speaker, you let us know something that I've just said is important and I want you to think about it for just a moment. But if I run through it to say, there's three components to executive presence. It's the pause, it's the stillness, and it's intentional eye contact. Those three together create executive presence. That's yeah. three yeah. thoughts in one sentence. You need the pauses to assimilate, to digest it. It's interesting. I, this is something I used to do with singers all the time. I used to say, I still do say, honor your, your punctuation. Honor the, the commas and the periods. Even if they're not written in there, you need to have a beginning and an end for people to understand that. Actually, when I work a lot in German, and I had a German teacher once who said, Elizabeth, your problem is that you, that in German, the verb comes at the end. So you have to know before you start the sentence what you want to say. You just start talking, and you just never know where you're going to go, and your sentence just goes on and around and around. You can't do that in German. <laughs> I... That was a really useful lesson, actually. I had not actually thought about that. I do find it's also a way that, do you find with the single-focused and multi-focused people that you have this difference? We've got the people who are going to drill down and they're going to say one thing, or the people who are thinking of lots of different things. That actually does, that's, a, that's a relevant to how you present, how, how your mind works. Some people tend to... Uh, develop a thought and then speak it. Other people tend to develop their thought as they speak. That, that's just the way that people's minds process. One is not better than the other. They're just different. That has no bearing on how you should be presenting your view. Um, that can, again, vary slightly with who you're talking to and what you're trying to accomplish. We've talked a lot about the difference between um, presenting as a man and presenting as a woman and the way, the different way that people perceive you. You have been both. How does that inform what you know about communication and getting your message across? It, 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 it forms so much in how I present because I'm well aware of how I'm being perceived by whomever I'm talking to. Uh, yes, for the first 10 years of my career, I was male, I was on stage, touring with Ram Trucks for three years. I did commercials, I did some TV work, I did a little bit of theater work, I you know, uh, modeled. So I'm, I was very well aware of what people, how they perceived me when they saw me, how they perceived me when I spoke. And in the 25 years since, I've pretty much replicated everything in a different way. And I'm well aware of that difference. The primary difference is that Frankly, coming into a situation and speaking as male, there is an implied credibility the moment I open my mouth. And coming in and speaking as female, that implied credibility is not there. I'll give you a very everyday example. 
I have an old car. I'm an old car buff. I have a 77 Mercedes 450 SL. And there's an auto parts store down the way. When I was male, I could walk into an auto parts store and say, hi, I need to get a set of spark plugs for a 77 Mercedes 450 SL. Coming right up, here you go, and they hand them to me. I go in as female, hi, I need a set of spark plugs for a 77 Mercedes 450 SL. Well, what's the problem? I need a set of spark plugs. You know, it could be the wire. Sometimes that, that's a problem there. No, no, the wires are fine. Well, you might want to check the distributor on those because those cars are like, no, no, if I could just, I have to quantify my ask. Really? So when you were an entrepreneur and you were pitching, how did you have to deal with quantifying and being perceived, especially pitching as a woman, right? Mm -hmm. In the days when there weren't all that many female founders. How, what did you learn from that? Well, what I, uh, what, there's a uh, primary philosophy that we talk a lot about at Stanford, at the GSB, and that, that is, is, is incredibly prevalent, and I, I'm drawing a blank on the two women uh, who created the, the, the diagram, but it's a triangle, and it's about knowing your aim. A-I-M is each point of the triangle, audience, intent, and message. Yes. That dictates everything you do is to be focused on your aim. Who are you talking to? What do you want them to, to do? What is your intent? And what do you want to say? What is your message? So going in pitching for funding, as we did back in the late 90s, who was I talking to? What, you know, what were their demographics? What are their backgrounds? What's going to excite them? What is my intent? What do I want them to do? What's my call to action going to be? And then how am I going to present it? What is the message? So understanding that I was primarily, this, this was a group of three men, I needed, I, I knew how they were going to respond. I knew their age and I knew that if I spoke and I used Upspeak and if I were to talk like this and I would finish my sentences up here, I was not going to have any credibility. Gone. If they were women I was talking to, I would have inserted more Upspeak because that is more indicative of how women speak and younger millennial men as well. So... I practiced a speech pattern that I knew would resonate with them. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily saying that was exactly how I speak all the time, but I knew it would work. I always could be coming back to, it's all about them. Rule number one in presenting, it's who's listening. And uh, 100%, 100%. 100%. do you talk about, you talk about authenticity. And you had a great phrase. I heard you once talking about authenticity being like pregnancy. And then you have a word of your own. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Uh, I, I, tend, I believe that the word authentic is played out. And I think it's overused. It's watered down. You know, and people talk about being, you know, that, that, you know, there's a certain level of authenticity. And it's like, I always think of being authentic, either you are or you aren't. It's like you're pregnant. You can't just be a little bit. Yes. So, <laughs> you know, and that's why I think that authentic has been overused it, it, to the point that it's relevant. And I, I came up with the word authentatious because I wanted something that was more proactive sounding. So the phrase is to be authentatious. And what does it mean to be authentatious? It means to be, you know, voracious and vivacious and audacious and bodacious. You have to be more than authentic. The loudmouth drunk at the end of the bar can be authentic, but that's not helping anyone. That's not changing anyone's life for the better. That's not inspiring anyone. And authentatious is doing exactly that. I love it. Yes, I have a, I have a Gina Graham uh, postcard up on my wall. It says, be authentatious. And I look at it regularly. So, uh, so I love that. You are also a, you are also the president of the Golden Gate Business Association, which is a chamber of commerce for the gay community in the San Francisco Bay Area. How yes. can we think about diversity or communicating either to someone who is a minority or if we are in a minority? I've got a couple of questions. Talk about it first. How you see business 
from the point of view of a minority chamber of commerce? Hmm. From the from this view, diversity, as you mentioned and referenced earlier, is so incredibly important. Uh, my personal, my company, which is the Graham Institute, our value statement says that uh, we believe that only when traditionally marginalized people, women, LGBT, people of color, have a voice in the conversation, not just a seat at the table, will organizations and the world reach their full potential. And I believe the same thing is true in business throughout. And as a Chamber of Commerce, that is a value I believe that we hold. It's, we've reached a point in, in, in our society, uh, Western society specifically, that there's, you know, when President Obama was president, we heard we're in a post-racial period. Often we'll pe people will think that we're in a post-gender period because now, you know, women are everywhere and there are, you know, we have a growing acceptance of non-binary. So we're in a post-gender period. And the reality is quite different. There's, there's a massive difference between having a seat at the table and having a voice in the discussion. And we have that seat at the table and now we need to have that voice. And what we do as a Chamber of Commerce, what we strive to do is to advocate and educate and provide opportunity for LGBT small businesses within the greater business world. Talk more, please, about having a voice as opposed to just having a seat at the table. It's tremendously important. It's too often, and you're probably able to relate to this, uh, I'll do corporate trainings and the room might be half filled with women or more, yet when I, as I go through the course of the presentation or other trainings, each woman will tell me that in their daily life in, at work, they're the only woman in the meeting. So mm -hmm. while at this moment in time, they represent half of the room, in reality, they're the singular or one of two women in all of their meetings. They have a seat at the table, they don't have a voice. They're talked over by men. Men step over women verbally in meetings 350% more often. So simply being in the room is not going to constitute change. This is a huge part of what I do with my clients indeed. So I'm curious to know, how do you recommend, what, what steps do you recommend or what strategies do you recommend for those who feel they aren't being heard? There's a variety. First off is you need to own your expertise. Yes. You know, one of the things that I will often tell, uh, especially when I talk to all women, is I love to look at everybody in the room and just stop for a minute and say, none of you have this job because you're pretty. None of you were hired because you're fun at parties or you tell great jokes. You're here for one reason only. You're smart, you're good at your job, you kick ass and you get shit done, frankly. And you need mm -hmm. to own your expertise. Now, saying you are an expert doesn't mean you never make mistakes. Being an expert doesn't mean you don't change your mind when new data becomes available, but you have to be able to say that you are an expert. I love that. I love that. I want to like print that out and put it up in front of everybody I work with. <laughs> it's so fun. It's, yes, it's great. So how own our expertise? How? How do you do it? There's, there's a lot of uh, little exercises that I'll take people through in one-on-one -on -one coaching or in team settings that I can do. What I would say to people, a couple, a couple strategies right off the top, when you have an opinion when you, to jump into the conversation, do so. When was the last time you were in a meeting and you saw a man raise his hand? Mm -hmm. Probably not that often. It doesn't, definitely doesn't happen. So for women who want to get engaged in the conversation, Raising your hand, generally speaking, again, it can vary by culture, by, by the company, by whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, you don't find men raising their hand to voice an opinion. You need to jump in as well. If you wait to be called, you're going to keep waiting forever. Right, right. Secondly, when you do speak, don't undercut your expertise before you start to speak. I hear this all the time where women will uh, jump into a meeting and say something along the line of, you know, I know this is going to sound stupid and we probably already tried this, but what if we did this? And yeah. they threw out two diminishing statements before they actually offered their opinion. And you can't do that. 
you need to jump in with your opinion. Don't undercut your position before you say it. Yes, exactly. And those are the internal blocks that people come to. How about finding allies? So if you're being talked over or if somebody else hears your idea and then presents it as their own five minutes later, which believe it or not still happens all the time. Yes, how? It's called, it's called heat heat-eating. Heat heating. But actually it's not just men who do that. I've had women do that to me. Women who were very single focused and, you know, like out there talking and just on, on a tear. And um, I, not too long ago, actually, was a woman, I knew her very well. And I, I was actually able to say, did you say that because you heard me say that five minutes ago and you thought it was a good idea? Or did you actually not hear me? And she said, oh, no, I just thought it was a good idea. But did you say that? And I thought, really, it's like a woman doing that to another woman. It's fortunately, we know each other very well. So uh, um, I was, you know, it's, it's, she was very single focused. And she was on a tear and she was too busy talking to listen. So that happens too. How about getting allies who can be the one to say that was, you know, that was actually, that was just Gina's idea. What a great thing. Something like that. Instead of being, Hey, that was me, you know, cause that you undercut yourself that way too. Uh, there's a variety of ways you can do that. One is the, the best way to get strong allies is to be a strong ally. So for other women in the meeting and other men in their meeting. So if you find someone who is taking credit for something other people have done, is to be the one to go, well, yeah, you know, that was a great idea, but Elizabeth said that that's exactly what Elizabeth said. So I totally agree. That's a great idea. Give the credit to other people in real time. If you can't do it in real time, it's not going to build the credibility. Um, I mean, now, also, that's right. most yeah. people who do that, who step over and repeat or he peat or whatever like that, or mansplain, don't realize that they're doing it. So when you can, when someone can bring it out in real time, they're like, oh my God. So it's, you're not slamming them, but just those little bits of, yeah, that is a great idea. And, you know, I heard, you know, Carol was just talking about that, or Steve was mentioning the same thing. Be the good ally for other people, mm -hmm. number one. And secondly, if, you, if you, it's something that's pervasive with someone who is more senior, I would suggest after this happens in a meeting, get with them one-on-one -on -one and have the conversation. Just wanted to bring this up. Did you realize you effectively took my idea, Elizabeth's idea, Carol's idea from someone else and repeated it as your own? You know, and get their feeling on it. If they're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea I did that. I'm so sorry, I'll try to pay attention. Great, if they come back with, well, you all work for me, so it doesn't matter. All right, now you know where you stand in this particular room. But mm -hmm. to do that privately, to not, not challenge them in public is one yeah. way. Uh, use soft power is, is another way to build that. If you have people that are more introverted, as every company does, uh, there are people that are more introverted, more extroverted. Too many, often people in meetings call on people that are extroverted. Extroverts jump first. Exhibit, exude soft power. Be the one person to say, you know, Elizabeth, you've been quiet all meeting and I'd love to get your feedback on this. Or, hey, we were just, Elizabeth and I were just talking about this yesterday and she had a great idea surrounding this. Would you mind sharing it with the group? Be the one that brings them in if the manager or whoever has arranged the meeting doesn't. So yeah. you be the one to exhibit soft power. Yes, exactly. I, I love that. I love that. Uh, being authentacious at work, is it safe to do that? Is it dangerous to do that? Well, I don't know how I would define dangerous. It's, you know, uh, as well, I go back to uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, you must do one thing every day that scares you. Uh, mm -hmm. So absolutely. If, if you don't do anything that pushes you outside of your comfort zone, you are not going to grow, period, in any, any part of life. So be authentic at work, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And how do I define that? That is standing up for yourself and standing up for others. And it's being honest and accountable. That's what leaders do. Leaders don't deflect. You know, that, that's the easy way out. 
Dana Graham, this has been so much fun and so interesting to talk about this. Your company is the Graham Institute of Strategic Communications. How do we find you? Correct. Uh, it's a long name, but it's a short URL. It's basically the, T-H-E, G-I-S-C. So it's the G-I-S-C dot com. That's wonderful. And do you have one thought you can leave us with? Yes, absolutely. To every person listening to the podcast or watching the video, you have the ability to change. And, and I will, I'm going to echo the Stanford model, the GSB model. You have the ability to change lives, change organizations, and change the world. Don't doubt your expertise. Don't sell yourself short. Aim higher. I love it. Thank you so much. This has been Speakers Who Get Results. Don't forget, before, before you leave, you want to go over to our free assessment, www.speakforresultsquiz.com. That's speakforresultsquiz.com. And if you, uh, if you can see there in about four minutes where you are rocking your presentation skills, where you're great, and where you might need a little bit of support. This has been Speakers Who Get Results. I'll see you on the next one. We have just concluded another great episode of Speakers Who Get Results with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. If you got value from today's episode, please feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues. You may also visit elizabethbachman.com for additional resources. Be sure to tune in every week for new episodes. And thanks for tuning in.